Father, as we come this morning now to look to your word, thank you for yet another time, another privilege to stand behind this sacred deck and to proclaim your word, to edify, to encourage, to uplift, and yes, even to convict of these thy people that we might be better servants for you now and in the future than we have been in the past. Thank you for assembling each one of us here in this place this day. Please forgive us of all of our sins. Cleanse us. We ask from all of our unrighteousness. Open thou now my lips and my mouth shall show forth in thy praise. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Let us all say amen again and Certainly, we thank the Lord for these children today. Today is not the fourth Sunday, so you may be wondering why, there's, why they are singing today uh, rather than the fourth Sunday. That's because fourth Sunday is Easter. And as a result of that, we are looking to have some combination of our singing groups on Easter morning. And so they're singing today. So we thank the Lord uh, for them and thank the Lord for the director and for the ministry of music and for the musician and the choir parents and all who are helping them. Just before I read the message or read the scripture, rather, I do want you to add to your prayer list, please. Uh, Sister Ella Eskridge got a... Uh, text this morning that um, uh, there may be some um, issues going on with her. That's the reason why Sister Marion is not here uh, this morning. She asked the church to please be in prayer. So please add Sister Eskridge to your prayers. I want you to join with me this morning in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now what will be on the screen behind me is just verse 24, unless the media is... Um, puts these other two verses up there, but I want to read verses 22, 23, 24, but the primary emphasis is going to be coming from verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 22 through verse 24. The apostle Paul writes and says, to the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. The thought I want you to have this morning is run, Christian, run. You might be seated. Run, Christian, run. I don't know if this is the summer uh, that we will, that the Olympics will once again be uh, 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 on in their event, on their displays and things, but whatever it is, all of us are familiar with races, whether it's the Olympics or whether we were in high school or grade school or just having fun uh, with our friends uh, up and down the streets in our neighborhoods, we are familiar with being in a race. 
what we sometimes though do is forget that sometimes it's okay if all I want to do is get into a race for some fun because when me and my friends get into a race for some funds, it doesn't make any difference what the rules are. It doesn't make any difference what the prize is. And many times there isn't any prize other than boasting rights. Or I beat you or I'm faster than you. But then when it comes to more structured type of races, there's more than just getting in a race. There's some things that need to be considered. There's some preparations that need to be made. There's some rules that need to be followed. And I don't know anybody who spends all of their time and energy preparing for a race like that that we might see in a track and field event in the Olympics. I don't know of anybody who spends years training and going through special diets and exercises and making the personal sacrifices to get their body into shape only to make it to the main event, get on the track and then decide that uh, I'm just going to half-heartedly run down a track. I don't care whether I win or not. No, everybody on every Everybody on that field, everybody on that track has prepared with the same goal in mind, and it is running all the way to the end. The problem is, though, is sometimes when it comes to the matter of church, we sometimes have a tendency to forget that. The Apostle Paul is using this analogy in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, as this matter of athletics or, or this running event because the Greeks were known for their athletic events, which involved some races. As a matter of fact, that's where the idea of the Olympics come from. So he's using this terminology in this chapter to remind them, to remind us about our responsibility of being in this race for the Lord. He opens the book by really spending quite a bit of time defending his apostleship because there were some who did not want to believe and accept the apostleship of, the, uh, of Paul. So he defends that there are some who wanted to put false charges up on him and, and question him about the, re the reception that he may have received by gifts and things like that so that he could live. So he, in this same chapter, he is defending that to let the people know, you know, that those who proclaim the gospel are to live by the gospel and really that that was no different than what the Lord said in the Old Testament, that the muzzle that uh, treadeth out the corn also, or uh, that treads also needs to, uh, I forget how that scripture goes, that muzzle not the ox that trebles, that tre treads out the corn. I'm sorry. In other words, if, the, if, if you're in the work, then you ought to benefit from the work. And so he's emphasizing that particular thing, recognizing, recognizing it, particularly when you get up to our day and time, and not just our day and time, it happened in his time too, that there are some that are in this race, there are some that look like they're in this race from the pulpit to the back door that's in it for personal reasons. In, in other words, they're in it for personal gain. And they're, they're not really concerned about running to the end. They're not really concerned about the people. They're not really concerned about what God's instruction is. In other words, I want people to know me. I want all the, I want all the money. I want all the gifts. I want all the recognition. In other words, I want the prize because I want to get in a race. But, but Paul is letting them know in this chapter that, that that's not the category he's in. As a matter of fact, at one point he said, I'd rather die uh, rather than have that carry that type of label. What he says is come down to that point. I'd rather die than walk around having somebody put that type of label on me because running this race is a serious matter. Running this race is a serious matter. But then when we talk about running this race, let's look at a few things as a matter to the matter of the race defined. And when I want to define the race, I want to define it in this particular category. <clears throat> It's not, first of all, we need to understand that when I'm talking about this race, I'm not talking about a foot race. I'm not talking about automobile races. I'm not talking about racing cars and things like that. This is a race on the spiritual side. It has nothing to do with who's the fastest and who's the slowest. The, the key is, will you finish the race? It's not a matter of whether you're big or tall, whether, you're, whether you weigh a lot or don't weigh a lot. That's not the category in this category of race. So when we talk about race, we're talking about a Christian race that is unlike any other race. 
the writer in Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, right here in Hebrews chapter 12, we see that this is a race with witnesses. In other words, there, there's, and these witnesses that the writer in Hebrews talks about that we are comp compassed about with so great witnesses, he's not talking about some people on the sideline cheering us on. If you look further in Hebrews chapter, back in chapter 11, you discover that there's a, there's a list of those who demonstrated faith in God, Abraham and Moses uh, and Enoch and all the rest of them demonstrated faith in Moses. So witnesses in this category isn't talking about somebody looking down on us saying, go ahead, you can do it. This is talking about somebody who has already demonstrated that you can complete the race. This is somebody who's already demonstrated on how to run this race by faith. So he says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, since we have so many examples of different witnesses who trusted God for so many various things through their life, we can learn from them too. So he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us. We need to pay attention to this church because it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Weight in this category of scripture is different from sin. Sin is any violation, any disobedience, any unrighteousness before God. So that is sin. But sometimes we can do something that is right. It might be okay to do something. It might be okay to get involved in something. And, and there might not be anything wrong with it, but it can turn out to be a weight. It can slow you down. It can get you off the track. It can distract you so that you can't run this Christian race the way that you're supposed to. It's okay uh, to have a job and, 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 to, and to make a little extra money in overtime sometime, but then it can be a weight if every time you turn around, you wanted to ask the boss, give me some more overtime so I can make some more money. Give me some more overtime so I can make some more money. And before you know it, you've got more concern about making the money than you are about running a race because the devil wants to keep you focused on making the money because if he gets you focused on making more money, then you're just going to take that money and buy more stuff. And the more stuff you get, you're going to not going to be too long before that stuff is the one that's got you all twisted up and you don't forget about running this race. It's nothing wrong with having some of the things, but, but by the same token, we need to be careful because these things are weights that can slow us down. How many times have you watched the Olympics or watched some other track and field event on TV and you see these runners get down in their particular lanes on the track? And how many of you have seen anybody get down on the track get on their mark. The, the referee is standing on the side of the track with a gun raised ready to fire the shot to send the runners off. How many of them see, have you seen them down in that three-point stance or whatever they call it with a three-piece suit on? <laughs> How many of you seen them get down, some, some, of, some of the ladies on the track get down with some very expensive five or six hundred dollar dresses on or evening gowns and high heel shoes and platforms and that sort of, how many of you have seen people get on the track dressed like that? There's nothing wrong with those clothes, but those clothes are not conducive to running a race that they're about to get in. So he says, lay aside every rate which so, and the sin which does so easily beset us and then let us run with patience. In other words, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So the race has with it witnesses and it's a settled race because we run this race with patience. You can't hurry it. Only God has a timetable. You've just got to run it one day at a time. I realize that we live in a hurry up fast paced society and we live in a, in a technological society and we want everything done right now. I want to cook right now. So I hit the microwave. I want to die a number right now so I hit speed dial. I want this done right now so I put it on my fast operating computer. I, I want to get here right now so I get, go flying down the street in my fast car. We want right now so we make instant coffee rather than, rather than doing something else. We want it right now. And there's some things you just can't do right now. Amen, pews. Some things take time. Some things take patience. And when it comes to running this Christian race, we have to have patience because we're not in this of ourselves. This is, the, this is God's race. He's the one who set this thing before us, which is the last category when it says the race that is set before us is a set race, and that set race is set by Jesus Christ himself. Because the very next verse that we didn't read there in, in Hebrews chapter 12 says, talks about Jesus. 
Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So in other words, it's a, it's a race with witnesses who show us how to do it. It's a settled race. We've got to be patient in running this race. And this is a race that we don't create. It's a race that Jesus himself has established already. But you know that when it comes to, when it comes to getting in a race, do you know that there are basically two kinds of runners? There's basically two kinds of runners. There are those who are the sprinters, and then there are the, those who are the long-distance runners. The problem in some of our churches, though, is we don't realize that this Christian race is not a sprint race. There's some who want to take a few steps. Oh, I'm tired. I think I'll go home and sit down. There's some who come in there all excited and they want to run for a little while and they want to do this and they want to do that. And then when somebody says something they don't like, well, I'm tired and, and I don't think I don't do it all. And so they want to go, that, that's a sprint race. But no, long distance race mean, mean, mean that you're in it for the long haul. That means you've got some distance to go, which means your body's got to be prepared to run this race all the way. Because God doesn't have time for quitters. <laughs> Amen, pews. He doesn't have time for good. So this is a long distance race. That's why Paul says, run this, complete this, uh, the race that is set before you. Why? Because the reason for the run, the reason for the run is this. First of all, we are commanded to, as we've already seen in Hebrews chapter 12, because even though the writer of Hebrews says, let us run with patience this race, or, or rather, uh, uh, th this race that is set before us, let us run it with patience, and these sort of things, we've also got to understand that none of God's instructions Instructions are, if you want to do this, it's okay. If you don't want to do it, well, that's okay. I understand. I mean, you can go on and do what you want to do. No, every instruction in Scripture is a divine command, even though it may be put in the category of instruction. It's a divine command from God because the Bible itself is divinely inspired by God. Are you listening to me, church? So to run, uh, the reason for, to run this race, you know, the reason for this race is we are commanded to run it. We are expected to to run it because we have examples of those who have already run this race before us and we, if we've truly been born again we ought to desire to run it. Are you listening to me? Because Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, he says for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, it is God, in other words it comes from God you don't create it, that you don't create the enthusiasm. You don't create the desire. You don't create the motivation. It all comes from God. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God who gives us desire to do it and not only does he give us the desire to do it, he gives us the, the, the ability to complete the task that he set before us. So run with patience the race that is set before you. Are you listening to me? But then why are we running? Because we want the prize. We want the prize. How many times, again, backing up to the Olympics, how many times have you seen somebody come in first place and win the gold medal, and then when they get ready to get the gold medal, they say, I don't want it, give it to somebody else. No, they run because they want the prize. And some of you might say, well, brother pastor, what then is the prize? Well, that would take a complete another sermon in about two or three parts to really explain all of the category of prizes, so to speak, that's wrapped up in this race, and we still don't know the full measure of it. But let me just remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we are reminded that every man's work is going to be tried of what sort it is. Some of wood, hair, stuff, uh, wood, hair, stubble, some of precious uh, stone, gold, and silver, but every man's work, talking about every believer now, every man's work is going to be tried of what sort it is. And it's going to be tried by the fire of God. And Paul says in that chapter, in that third chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, when, it, when, the, when the fire of God tests it, he says, if that man's work remains, he will receive a reward. He will receive a prize. He will receive a well done from God from, the, from using the gifts, from using the talents, and from 
finishing the race like he was supposed to. But then if somebody who has been busy about themselves doing their own thing, their own way, for the praise of men, for somebody to pat them on their back, their works are going to end up in what's kept and called wood, hay, and stubble. And you know what happens to wood, hay, and stubble when you set fire to it. It all burns up and there's nothing left, which means the person then receives no reward. Now, I'm going to point out something to you right here because this is very important. When I say wood, hay, and stubble works, they get burned up and there's no reward. I'm not talking about unsafe folk. Paul is not talking about unsafe folk. He's talking about the saved folk. He's talking about the redeemed folk. These are the saved folk that this scripture is written to, to let us know, no, just because you saved don't mean that you're going to get everything from God that he has from you if you have not been faithful. So you listen to me, church? I mean, it's good to come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, but church, there's more to this race than showing up on Sunday morning. There's more to this race than popping up to a program every now and then. There's more to this race because God wants to use you on Monday. God wants to use you on Tuesday. God wants to use you on Wednesday. God wants to use you throughout the rest of the week. And if all your mind is set on Sunday, then you can't be available for him to use on the other six days of the week. So no, we've got to have our mindset to, to, to be faithful in this work that he has called us to. But also in Matthew 25, when the Lord finishes talking about the talents uh, and that sort of thing, and then he kind of gives a parable. He says, he says, he says uh, uh, there's a group of people, he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to see about me. And then he's going to say, in that judgment day, there's going to be some who will say, well, Lord, when did we see you and when did we do this? And he says, as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And then he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Are you listening to me? That, that is the prize. That is, that is the main portion of the prize is to hear the Lord of glory himself say to us, well done, my child. Well done, my son. Well done, my daughter. I got news for you. If you had all of the blessings, all of the money and all of the mansions and all of the positions and all of the titles, if you owned every bank and every institution on the face of the earth, it would not be a drop in the bucket to God's divine well done said to you because all of this stuff is going to disappear all of this stuff is going to be destroyed all of this stuff is going to fade away because Bob, the Bible says that one day God is going to destroy this earth and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth I want that which is going to last forever so the bottom line is run this race all the way to the end yeah. are you listening to me church but then there's the call of the race. The call of the race. And there's basically two things to the call of the race. One is, if you're going to be in the race, you need to be lawful. In other words, recognize that the race has some rules. And then you need to be determined. Lawful. A runner must abide by the rules if he's going to have a winning performance. The runner must abide by the rules if he's going to have a winning performance. Let me put it this way. You got a, let's say a two lane track. You got two runners down there side by side. The gun sounds. They both come out of the starting block running as hard as they can. The rules say you stay in your lane. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying what I'm saying. The rules say you stay in your lane. Because if you get out of your lane, then the rules say you get disqualified because what you do is you end up hindering somebody else. Now what happens in the church? There's a whole folk in the race on the track the gun has sound and we're supposed to be running down the track one with another not to try to beat each other but try to help each other get to the end but the problem is somebody won't stay in their lane yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
This over here wants to interfere with that group. And that group over there, I'm going to interfere with that group. And that group over there, I'm going to interfere with the pulpit and tell the pastor what to do. Stay in your lane. God doesn't have any room for cheaters. And those, there's no award for cheaters. God doesn't reward and never will give a reward to cheaters. And I want to tell you something about, about God's race versus man's race. You see, they're, they're, the, in spite of all the efforts, somebody who's real cunning can cheat in man's race. Well... Let me show you how. It, it, until, until some modern day ability, there were some who used to take certain type of elements, certain kind of drugs well. to give them an edge. And there wasn't anything in place at the time to discover that somebody was cheating. But then when it was discovered, even if they received the medal, they were disqualified. And as a result of that, somebody else was given the medal. God doesn't have any award for cheaters. But now while somebody might get away with cheating on man, nobody can get away from cheating with God. You know why? Because he knows what you're going to do before you know what you're going to do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He knows where you're going before you know it. He, he knows what your motive is. We say all the time, the Lord knows my heart. He, mo he most certainly does. He knows every motive. He knows, that when, he knows that when what's coming out of your mouth doesn't match what's on your inside. He knows when you're real about him. He knows when you're sincere and when you're not. He, he knows everything there is to know about us. He knows when we're real and he knows when we're following the rules. Yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. He sees us running. Therefore, we need to run the way that we're supposed to. But not only is it, does the call of run mean we have to run lawful, it means we also have to be determined. In other words, church, this is not an easy race. Deliver me from church folk who says, oh, it's easy to serve. It's easy. You know what that person is telling me? They don't know nothing about following the Lord. If it's easy, it's also telling me you ain't doing nothing for the Lord. How you know that, brother pastor? Because every time, and I do mean every time, you get ready to do something for the Lord, you can expect that devil to show up. And he doesn't make it easy. So if you're talking about it's easy, all you're telling me is you ain't even doing enough to get the devil's attention. <laughs> Amen, Pews. It's not an easy race. It requires sweat. I sat there, Brother Deacons, and just, the other, just yesterday, I was watching on the TV, and they were advertising all these exercise machines, and I have to admit, some of them look like they would work pretty good. Uh, and then I was watching all these exercise machines, and they were operating, I seen these people running and bending these things and twisting their bodies, and you know what? The, what, the, what they were doing, what they, exercise, they, they were sweating. They were perspiring. Because the labor that they were doing was hard work. On this Christian race, or in this Christian race, sometimes we have to sweat because we have to deal with some opposition. We have to deal with some ups and downs. We have to run up some hills. We've got to deal with some adverse atmosphere. We've got to run in some foul weather. It's not an easy race. No, sir. But then you're called to run and not walk. Uh -huh. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, wake up. He'll be done in a minute. We're called to run and not walk. Sometimes, like I said, you have to run up some hills. Sometimes you got to run against the wind. Some, sometimes a foul spirit, there's a foul spirit even inside the church running from what, this person to that person that can get in the way, but you can't let that stop you. You got to remember that you're on the track for the Lord and you're in the race and you got to keep on sweating. You got you got to keep on running. You, you got to keep your head up. You, you got to run against the wind sometimes. See, you ain't got, none of those runners on the track can control the wind. 
They can't control the direction of the wind. They can't control how hard the wind is blowing. They only got one focus. Run that race as hard as you can, no matter what direction that wind is blowing from. So if you're going to be in a race, make up your mind to run all the way in spite of the resistance. You listen to me, church? Because there's some persistence that's called for. And what all persistence means is this. Persistence means that there's a quality that allows someone to continue doing something or trying to accomplish something in spite of the difficulty or being opposed by other people. Persistence. Determination. Keep going. You want to call me a name? That's okay. Keep running. You don't like me? That's okay. Keep running. You want to talk about me? That's okay. Keep running. Somebody want to put your name on the wings of the morning? That's all right. Keep running. If somebody want to put a stumbling block on your way, don't forget, there's some runner that are called hurdlers. <laughs> you hurdle and keep on running. <laughs> Paul says this to kind of give us an example in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. He says, for now, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Look at what he says in verse 7. He says, for I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And here's a prize. And henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But then Paul doesn't get selfish with it. He goes on a bit further. He says, and not me only, but for all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, stay in the race. (laughs) Because the Lord's got something for you. If you'll stay in the race. Well, what about the place of this race? Where we're supposed to run this race. In the first place, you need to understand what Paul says in first, or rather in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You have to have your mind made up, made up that if you're going to be in this race, that you ain't ashamed, you, you, you got your mind made up that you ain't ashamed of Jesus. You're not ashamed of the gospel. You're not ashamed of the world. Word. You, you don't apologize for nobody for believing in, in, in God, for believing in his word, for trying to order your life according to what God said. You don't apologize for nobody. Yes, sir. Donald Trump or nobody. Yes. Hillary or nobody. Yes. Cruz or nobody. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. The president or nobody. The mayor or nobody. The church does not apologize for being a child of God. And Paul says that. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. While they're trying to figure things out, we've got something that has a power of God that will straighten it out. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> So that means then, where am I supposed to run this place? Everywhere. Uh When I'm on a job, I'm supposed to be running. When we're at school, we're supposed to be running. When we're at home, we're supposed to be running. If it's just a casual social event somewhere, wherever we are, we're supposed to be running. The the only time you ain't running this race is when you sleep. Amen, Hughes. Everywhere. And at all times, all times, just like Paul told Timothy, Timothy, preach the gospel. Be instant, in season and out of season. In other words, be ready at all times. We're supposed to be in the mode of running this race at all times. When things are good, when things are not so good, we're supposed to be running this race. And that brings me then to the scope of this run. What about the scope of this run? I just told you. The scope of this run is that we run through the good times and we run through the bad times 
And back and forth we go, back to the good times, back to the bad times, back and forth we go all the way through life's journey. How long until this race is over? Because in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, the Lord tells the church, which applies to every individual as well as the church, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. You listen to me church? But then there's a preparation to run. There's a preparation to run. And the preparation to run is this. To be qualified, get in shape, get in position, and then run. Did you get that? Be qualified, get in shape, get in position, and then run. First of all, we need to understand what it takes to be qualified. I don't care how much you come to church, that will not qualify you. I don't care how much money you put in the bucket, that will not qualify you. I don't care if your mama and daddy built each brick of the church house by themselves, that will not qualify you. I don't care what your name or title is, that won't qualify you. The only qualification or the, 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 the qualification that has to be met in order to be in this race is you must be born again. John chapter 3 verse 3, Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. You cannot even see the kingdom of God if we have not been born of the spirit and of the water. We must be, in other words, that means be quickened, to be made alive in Jesus Christ. That happens when we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we acknowledge that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory. When we accept in our mind and believe in our heart that Jesus went to a hill called Calvary and there was crucified for our sins, paid our sin debt on Calvary, died that Friday, buried on Friday, but early Sunday morning, rose from the grave with all power and heaven and earth in his hand, sits right now on the right hand side of the Father. And one of these days is coming back after a church without spot or wrinkle and we believe that in our heart and confess that with our mind. the mouth the Bible says we shall be saved the Holy Spirit then comes in to, to about dwell in us he quickens our dead spirit and makes us alive in Christ adopts us into the family of God and our names being recognized already written in the Lamb's book of life we must first be qualified as a matter of fact somebody on the track that's not qualified is an imposter (laughs) and you got to watch imposters you know why because the imposters know they ain't real (laughs) they just go along with the flow they just want to be in the game because they like all the accolades they like all the pomp and circumstance but then when you know what happens to the imposters When things don't go the way the imposters way, they're not satisfied to get on the sideline and say, well, ain't no sense in me tripping up everybody else. No, they deliberately, intentionally try to trip others up. You ever heard the term misery loves company? (sighs) Qualified. But then we need to get in shape. And what does it take for us to get in shape? We got to sweat again, church. We got to work ourselves. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 through 27, in that same chapter that we're reading from, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 through 27, look what he says. He says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's still talking about this race. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible Verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. In other words, I'm not running wondering where I'm going. Or or so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. In other words, I'm not doing this in vain. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Getting in shape. None of us are in the shape we're supposed to be in. Some of us are overweight from eating the fast food of the world. And I ain't talking about Burger King and McDonald's. And I ain't talking about none of them. I'm just talking about the world stuff that we want to grab for ourselves and that sort of thing and live like the world. Some of us are just fat. 
with the world. And we need to lose some weight. You listen to me, church? We need to, we need to exercise, which means then we need to, we need to right diet. We need to eat properly. Even the world will tell us that there's some stuff we eat that's no good for this physical body. Well, church, that's true on the spiritual side. There's some stuff we take into our mind and our spirit that's not good for this spiritual body. Turn off some of this nonsense talk shows that don't believe in God and got all kind of man's philosophy and open up God's book and see what God has to say about the situation. Stop looking at all these people on TV. Their relationships are falling apart and you sitting there all mad and then your husband comes home or your wife comes home and you all mad because you what's seen on TV and you don't mess your relationship up. says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth this is what helped get us in shape to run this race and then when somebody don't want to forgive you you know what to do about it when somebody doesn't treat you right you know what to do about it when somebody's lied on you you know what to do about it when somebody don't support you you know what to do about it you won't hang your head you'll keep your head up and keep on running because you're in shape from the word of God you listen to me church but not only that we need to get in position because you see I can be qualified and I can get in shape but if I don't get on the track I can't run the race so I need to get into position. In a position that, the thing that helps me get into the right position is prayer and availability to the Spirit of God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean that you have to walk around all day mumbling. That means you have to be driving down the highway mumbling, 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 walking around on your job and mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. No, that's not, that's not what the Lord is talking about. Our attitude, our disposition ought to be in a mode of prayer at all times. And what that does is help us to recognize and acknowledge God's presence about us anywhere we go. I think I told you some time ago, shared this with you maybe a couple of times, that a couple of years ago, my daughter came home and said, Dad, when I pull up in the driveway, uh, I thought it was a stick landing in the driveway, but when I got closer, it started to move. There's a snake out there on the driveway. And it was getting toward the evening time, and she came in and told me, told her mom, and they stood there and looked at me like, are you going out there to find that snake? In the dark? I don't think so. <laughs> but you know what? Before that time, my wife used to get out of the house in the evening, sun start going down, starting to get a, dark, a little dark, and walk around the house every night, because she put those little solar lights all around the house, and she used to like, them, like the, those lights, so she walk around the house every night, so she'd walk around the house. I could almost set my clock. When she go out the door, I knew what time it was. She was walking around the house until <laughs> Shakina came in and said, there's a snake out there. Here we are three years later. Do you know she still ain't walking around the house? Because there was a presence of something out there even though she didn't know where it was. When you and I get to the point where we can recognize the presence of God around us wherever we are, it ought to change our behavior. We need to get into position. And we do that by praying. And then Paul says in Romans chapter 12 that we are to submit our bodies as a living sacrifice. And then you know what to do? Now that you've been qualified, now that you're in shape, now that you are in the right position, run. Nike used to have a term, there's nothing to it but to do it. Run. Don't stand there on the track, run. But then I need to remind you that there are some challenges that come up to the run. And some of these challenges are that there's some folk who can't run the race 
because they spend too much time looking backwards. They can't run forward because they spend too much time looking backwards. Looking back at where I used to be. Looking back at where I was. Looking back at what I used to do. God is not taking you backward. He wants you to move forward. And you need your head straight. You need your face straight. And then run with patience this race that is set before us. Run. But then not only that, church, there's some folk who just like standing in the way. They get on the track, they won't run, they won't stay in their lane, they just want to stand in the way. Can't work for somebody being in the way. And they're easy to identify because if Jesus himself came down here and did something, they'd find 15 things wrong with what he's doing. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying what I'm saying. If I'm 15 things wrong, well, what is it? Why he should have did that? Well, why don't you just follow? So they just stand in the race or stand on the track. And there's some people that want to do it their way. Well, my lane ain't wide enough. I want mine a different color. I don't like this uniform, uh, and, and so I want to change something, and, and, and I want to do this, and I want to, listen, church, the first, the, one of the first things you and I need to understand about this race, and I've already told you, is it's not your race. God, Jesus himself has set this. He's established that according to Hebrews chapter um, 12 that we just read, and it's our job to run it according to his way. It's not about us. There's some people who just want to do it their way. But then the goal of the race is this. To glorify God and to obtain the prize. I'll be done in just a second. To glorify God and to obtain the prize. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. To the glory of God and to obtain the prize. Church, we need to run. And there's too many of us, there's too many people. When I say us, I'm not not just talking about progressive, I'm talking about we as Christians overall. There's too many of us that just want to do enough to get by. We just want to do a little bit to get by. On our jobs, we just want to do enough to keep from getting fired. It's okay if the boss wants to give us a raise, but we don't want to do a whole lot of work. We just want to do enough just to keep from getting fired. Well, if you're going to be in this race, we're called to give it all we have. Because if we don't, all we're doing is going through the motions. I want to ask you a question. Are you in the race? I don't want you to look at your neighbor. I want you to look at yourself. Investigate yourself. Are you in this race? And if you are, the next question we need to answer is what are you running for? What are, you, what, are you, what are you running for? What are you hoping to get? What, 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 what's your purpose for being in the race? If your reason for being in the race is to hear somebody, the pastor, somebody else call your name, you're in the race for the wrong reason. If the reason why you're in the race is so when it comes time for you to move, you can look back and say, look at all the grand stuff I did. You're in it for the wrong reason. Why are you running a race? It ought to be so that we can glorify God and hear him say, well done. Well, as I close this, I'm glad that we have the greatest example of finishing the race of all. And that's Jesus himself. I told you that the runners, before they get in the race, they start taking off stuff. (laughs) They start taking off the warm-up suit. They start taking off the other things. 
to get themselves all stretched and warmed up. Well, I want you to know that Jesus took off his royal robe in heaven, came down through 40 and two generations, born in Bethlehem of Judea, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and laid in a ranger. When he was born, he entered to run all the way to Calvary on your behalf and mine on this earth for 30 and 3 years and I got news for you he had to put up with some stuff he had to put up with some negative attitudes he had to put up with some negative uh, dispositions and winds he had to put up with Satan trying to tempt him on every side he had to put up even with family members not believing in who he was he had to put up with even the disciples not understanding he had to put up with even his close disciples denying him 3 times he had to put up with a disciple that gave him a kiss of 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 uh, uh, a kiss of betrayal. betrayal. Thank you, Sister Ford. He had to put up with all that. And then on top of having to put up with all that, he had to put up with being marched from judgment hall to judgment hall all night long, but he was in the race. Yeah. I'm, glad to, I'm glad that when they hit him the first time, I didn't, I'm glad he didn't say, oh, that's enough. I can't take no more. I quit. I'm glad he didn't quit, church. Yeah. But they marched him from judgment hall to judgment hall. They marched him all night long. And, and then when they marched him all night long, they set him before Pilate. Pilate couldn't find anything wrong with it. Was ready to wash his hands of it. But the crowd kept saying, crucify him. And then pretty soon he, they, he released him over to, the, over to the soldiers. And the soldiers took him and tied him up and whipped the skin from his back. Placed a crown of thorns upon his head. Brought him back before Pilate. And they put a cross on his shoulders and marched him up a hill called Golgotha. And laid him down on a cross and nailed him to that cross. Nailed his hands and his feet he, because he was in the race. He was in the race to get our salvation. And I'm glad that in spite of all that, he didn't quit. I'm glad that in spite of all that, he didn't give up. I'm glad in spite of all that, even though he sweat and re re sweat like great drops of blood, he didn't quit. But he hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour and then looked up toward heaven and Father and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. And then they took him down off that cross and put him in a tomb, Joseph New Tomb, on Friday. He laid there. But I got news for you. Even though he was dead, he was still in the race. <laughs> Laid there Saturday morning, and while he was still laying there Saturday morning, he was still in the race. Laid there Saturday night, and even though he was dead, he was still in the race. But early Sunday morning, I want you to know that the race that he stepped out with all power and heaven and earth in his hand to complete the race. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stayed around here a few days and caught a cloud and went on back to heaven sit down at the right hand side of the father and said one of these days he's coming back out there church without spot or wrinkle but the command to us is to stay in the race because the battle has already been won the victory has already been obtained all you've got to do is run the course unless somebody get confused before I get out of here let me say this this might sound like this might sound like that. This is all dependent on you. No. We're in the race by grace. So once we're in the race by grace, we run the race through faith. You listen to me, church? You get in the race by grace. In other words, ain't what you've done is what Jesus has done. You're in the race by, by grace, but now that we're in the race, we're to run by faith all the way to the end. When is the end going to be? We don't know. I don't know when my time is out. You don't know when your time is out. These children don't know when their time is out. All of us don't have the same time to be out. Some get timed out while they're young. Some get timed out in their middle years. Some get timed out in their older, in their older years. It doesn't make any difference how much time you got. Whatever time it is, run the race to the end. Run, Christian, run. There might be one here this morning that does not know the Lord and the part of their sin. He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. 
He said, if there's anyone that will open up the door, he said, I will come in and sup with him. And he with me. When he says open up the door, he's talking about open your heart's door. He's talking about if you understand what my gospel is about. If you understand that I came to this earth over 2,000 years ago. And I went to a, Cal, uh, to a hill called Calvary. There I was crucified for you. If you understand that. If you understand the reason why I did that. It's because of your sins. And, and, and the wrath of God was upon you. There was no way for you to pay that debt. If you understand that I took your place. Died in your place. Rose again so that you could have eternal life. And you're willing to accept that by faith into your heart. If you open up your heart's door, I'll come in. That's what he means. You accept it by faith. So if there's one here this morning who hasn't opened your heart's door to Jesus Christ, this is your time. Candidate for baptism, this is your time. 